right, if you're just joining us, welcome. Uh, we will start in just a moment. All right, so good afternoon or evening, everyone. So we are going to get started. So just a little disclaimer, um, this is going to be a family program. So just make sure that you are being appropriate um, in the chat or the Q&A, uh, wherever you might be asking your questions or interacting. Uh, it could possibly result in you being kicked or muted if you are not being appropriate. So I just have to put that out there before we start. And welcome. So today is a part of the One Truckee River Month series, and this is going to be all about the Lahontan Cutthroat Trout. And this is presented by us at the Nevada Department of Wildlife. So my name is Caitlin, and I'm an AmeriCorps educa uh, education <laughs> AmeriCorps person. So with me is Jessica Castle, and she is the Conservation Education Coordinator for Nevada Department of Wildlife. And to get started, we'll um, kind of go over the features. So if you are new to Zoom, um, we have our chat box, which is going to be uh, kind of look similar to this. So you're encouraged to use these throughout the program um, as well as the Q&A. So if you have any specific questions for me or a moderator, um, you can feel free to put that in the Q&A as well. So with the Nevada Department of Wildlife, a little bit about us. So we wear a lot of different hats. We have actually seven divisions total under our department. And a lot of that has to do with some things like game management, checking out our diversity uh, species and doing some of the different surveying for them as well. And also um, managing boats, uh, watercraft inspections and stuff like that. We have three regions total. So um, we are in the Western region and that is going to be where most of the focus will be today. So uh, the Trekker, uh, Truckee River area, as well as Lake Tahoe and Pyramid Lake fall under the Western region. And we also partner with a lot of other state agencies as well as federal agencies. So um, some of our work has to do with partnering with them as well. And with that, for today's webinar, uh, we're going to be learning all about the Lahontan cutthroat trout and its life history, uh, how the Truckee River has changed, um, so from its early days up until now, and then also understanding the conservation tactics for our Lahontan cutthroat trout. So we'll be talking a little bit about how that works, and also it would be good to pay attention just for the activity at the end, where we'll be talking a little bit about some management solutions for our hot and cut their trout and also be calling on the audience to be able to kind of contribute to their thoughts on the management strategies as well. So one thing that's important to understand with the Lahontan Cutthroat Trout is the ecology of the Truckee River. And it's super important and plays a role um, in, I guess, how we manage it and also how everything kind of fits together. So the Truckee River, um, it's rocks, gravel, and silt also help build the riparian zones. So they deliver super important nutrients to those areas, to the plants of those areas, to help it to grow a great amount of biodiversity. Um, and when we say biodiversity, that's going to be um, a large uh, kind of, I guess, variance of species. Um, also just the interactions that they have are going to be pretty extensive as well. And then with those variety of species living together and interacting together, that's going to provide us with some free ecological services. So it's going to bring in pollinators, it's going to bring in um, filtration of our water, it's going to bring fresh air, uh, so clean air, clean water, and also of course, uh, you know, vegetation that is going to help us as well. And so the Truckee River also creates an important food web as well. So it's a very vital habitat. And when we look at this food web, you can see that everything is kind of a piece to a larger puzzle and they all uh, contribute to an important balance. So taking any one of these things out, um, any one of these species out could result in a major change. So it's important to remember uh, when managing something as delicate as the Truckee River, that you want to make sure that you're not adding or taking out anything crazy. It's, it's a very 
uh, delicate equation to consider. And the long cutthroat trout also has its place in this huge puzzle as well. So that's why it's incredibly important that we focus on managing our Lahan cutthroat trout. So what is the Lahan cutthroat trout? So if you do not know what the Lahan cutthroat trout is, we'll kind of go over it a little bit today. So it is actually our state fish. Um, and with that, we have a state symbol for a lot of different things. So every state has maybe a state fish, state bird, state uh, flower, whatnot. So this is our state fish. And that's pretty awesome because it just shows off that we have such clean waterways. Uh, our trout can only survive in clean, clear, unpolluted waterways. So that's where they thrive. And our Lahontan and cutthroat trout actually has been improving lately. So having our Lahontan and cutthroat trout as our state fish is a pretty good testament to the um, excellent waterways that we have, as well as the clarity of the water and I guess the unpolluted uh, aspects of the river as well. And it has a number of important basic life history traits. So uh, this is the original range of it. So we are in the Western Lahontan Basin over here. So you can see that we've got Lake Tahoe and Pyramid Lake. And in between there runs Truckee, um, the Truckee River as well. There are also Lahontan cutthroat trouts that occur in the Northwest and Eastern Lahontan Basins. So about how big is it? Um, we have two different kinds of fish when we talk about our trout. So we've got our stream fish, which are about 10 inches or about one pound. And then we've got our lake fish, which are uh, extremely large compared to our stream fish. So they're about 50 inches or so, and then roughly about 40 pounds on average. But that's usually on the bigger side and they can be a lot smaller than that as well. And you can kind of see here just how big they can get. So this is from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And this is a pretty good way to kind of look at the identifiers as well. So they got that hooked lower jaw. You can kind of see the patch um, under their throat as well, which is what, where they get the cutthroat name from. So that red cut that is under their jaw. And then they've also got the white, or sorry, red um, cheek patches and pink patch along the side. And they're also this all over like kind of green color, like olive green color. And they can get between about five and 10 years old. Uh, so our stream fish are about five years on average and then our lake fish are going to be about 10 years on average. With their basic life history, so uh, they do spawn in the Truckee River and they do that February through July, spawning in a couple different streams as well across Nevada. And they're going to eat macroinvertebrates. So especially in the streams, macroinvertebrates are their main source of food. Um, and the bigger ones, especially in the lake, are going to be eating other fish. So if you're not sure what a macroinvertebrate is, this is what it looks like. Uh, they're usually just things like damselflies, uh, mayflies, stoneflies, little flies that um, haven't developed their wings yet and start their life in the water. So those are super important fish food. And if you ever go to the river and kind of muck up the bottom of the river, um, you might be able to catch some of these macroinvertebrates. So they're not just going to be, I guess, readily hanging out. They're a little bit harder to find. And as I mentioned, the trout are going to use the Truckee to move upstream for spawning. And this is incredibly important when we're kind of looking into how we're going to manage them. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later as well. So they do take this spawning journey that goes from Pyramid Lake all the way down to roughly Derby Dam. Um, so most of our Lahontan cutthroat trout are going to only be going up to the Derby Dam and not very many spawn past this point unless they are already kind of occurring in other parts of the Truckee River, therefore they might go up further. However, most of them are going to accumulate right before the Derby Dam. And another thing that is important when we're talking about the trout is that we also want to kind of understand their life history in terms of their life stages. So some people might be pretty well versed on the ecology of these fish. Some people may not be. So they're obviously going to start out as eggs and our Lahontan cutthroat trout can lay between 500 and 8,000 eggs on average. And once they've been fertilized and successfully developed without being predated or anything like that, they're going to develop into alvin which means that they're pretty small. They're maybe like a half inch or less and they will still have that egg yolk sac on them and that provides them a source of protein. So during this time, they're just kind of developing slowly um, over a few weeks. 
Then they develop into our fry, which are going to be larger. They're going to be starting to establish territories and going off on their own, actually starting to eat those macroinvertebrates. And once they have had some time to grow, they're going to be juveniles. And they'll usually stay a juvenile for a little bit of time um, before they become a full-size adult. And juveniles and fry are usually the most susceptible to predation. Then we get our spawning adults. So they get pretty big in the lakes like we just saw, um, but our spawning adult is going to go back in the cycle, create these eggs, and then eventually they will be predated. So a lot of our vulnerability is going to happen in these three stages. So the alvin, the fry, and the juvenile as well. And in order to kind of understand how we're going to manage the Lahontan and cutthroat trout, and I guess their importance to the Truckee River, it's important to understand historically what they went through and where they came from. So historically, they're incredibly important to the Paiute and Washoe tribes. Um, these tribes relied on the trout and kiwi of the area for the food source. And at the time, there were very bountiful populations of kiwi and Lahontan and cutthroat trout. Today, the kiwi is endangered and the Lahontan cutthroat, tra cutthroat trout is threatened as well. However, when uh, settlers arrived in this area, especially during, during the gold rush, um, they took note of all the different fishing methods that the natives used. Uh, a lot of these were going to be, you know, uh, trapping them in baskets or large nets and kind of uh, bringing them all out together in these large groups. So these miners um, and settlers pretty much took these methods home. However, they kind of changed it up a little bit. So the natives started selling that trout to the miners, but it wasn't long before they were using those bigger ways to catch fish. Um, and this significantly reduced the population. Um, so instead of just using, you know, your average size nets that would be good for a small group of people to be able to have enough fish for the week, they were taking huge large nests, nets and making a commercial fishing business out of this. And so therefore this led to a huge population decline. Um, and based on historical documentation from roughly the late 1800s, we knew that the Lahontan cutthroat trout occupied about 11 lakes and 600 streams in their peak population sizes. However, today they only occupy about 8% of the historical habitat, especially in streams. And I think it's less than 1% in their lake habitats. So that's a pretty significant decline. Um, although it used to be a lot worse, so we know that we have been improving this slightly. And a lot of other things hurt the Lahontan and cut their trout. Um, the river used to be a lot different in terms of how it looks. So today we don't see as many dams or irrigation canals, but at the time there was actually more than 50 dams between Tahoe and Bird Eye. And you can kind of see some of this evidence if you're driving along 80 and you see maybe remnants of where those dams were, uh, there actually used to be um, different reasons for those dams getting washed away. So floods, um, maybe they lost management, so nobody was taking care of them. So over time, they deteriorated. Um, a lot of the sawmills closed, so there wasn't any reason to really use them anymore. Um, and the sawmills also contributed a lot to the pollution since they were dumping their waste into the Truckee River at the time. And only now are we seeing that it has recovered from that pollution. So it does take a very long time for a system like the Truckee River to recover from massive pollution from something like a sawmill. Uh, also, the Truckee River had a lot more canals for irrigation diversion. And then they also had significantly more people catching hundreds of pounds of fish per day. And it was actually the way that they caught them and shipped them out to other parts of the country that significantly reduced this population. So they would catch I think up to hundreds of pounds of fish and then they would put them on trains and send them out to the different coasts and it was a delicacy in certain restaurants. So this was seen as a huge problem and they were completely overfished. But the Truckee River also used to have more Lahontan cut their trout. So trout numbers dropped from tens of millions of fish and um, in early journals of the area, so early settlers that came to the area, they noted that during spawning, you could see all the fish moving up the river um, and it was pretty significant. And now we're less than a million fish today. And at its lowest point, the region had only a couple thousand fish scattered in isolated populations. So you got a chat here, I'm just gonna check it out. 
Okay, yeah. So I'll actually answer this question too. So with the opening of the new fish screen at Derby Dam, are you tracking fish to see if any are spawning above the dam this year? So that's actually something that we'll cover right now. So um, we know that the Lahontan cutthroat trout was listed as endangered in 1970, um, and then its status changed to threatened in 1975 and has pretty much remained ever since. And with the Derby Dam being one of the, probably the biggest dams on the river, um, they kind of had to implement some different policies. So just this year in, or just in the last year in 2020, they started putting in um, those fish screens and it's actually been helping so they can move water without moving any of the fish into diversion streams. Um, and additionally, uh, they are looking into the effective use of those fish ladders and fish screens. So I'm sure by the end of this year, we should be able to have a better idea of how well that is working, um, especially with the spawning that just started in the last month or two. Um, it's going to take until probably uh, the end of the summer for us to really get a good estimate of how much it was used. So when we talk about the decline, it was pretty bad. And up until the 70s, people thought that the Lahontan cutthroat trout had gone completely extinct, when in reality, there was a small isolated population, um, a couple small po uh, isolated populations that were found and determined to be Lahontan cutthroat trout that had been missing for decades. So we were able to take some, uh, I guess a colony of those fish and start to raise them hatcheries and we started to recover the population as well. So in the late 90s we started really establishing these in the Pyramid Lake um, and Truckee region and this resulted in a lot of more availability for fishing. So the early 2000s saw really the complete reintroduction of the Lahontan cutthroat trout into the angler culture as well. And so for the first time in over probably 70 years, anglers were actually able to make a large catch of Lahan cutthroat trout because they were bigger than just uh, these juvenile small ones that were maybe less than a foot. They started getting to these bigger sizes. And today um, the anglers can take home either two small Lahan cutthroat trout or one large one, which is over two feet. So um, that's just the current rules that we have set in place with uh, the ability to take that many. And so with the other major issues facing the LCT today, we talked about some of them. So we talked about how we had, you know, massive overfishing, these um, dams, all these uh, major obstacles for their spawning and everything like that. But we still have some issues that remain that are a little bit different. So one thing is our competition with non-native fish. So we've got rainbows and brown trout that we stock. And those have been um, pretty bad for uh, interacting with the Lahontan cutthroat trout as well. They outcompete them and they also sometimes eat their young. So this is a pretty big problem, um, not only with like maybe stocked fish that are sterile, but also um, historic populations of rainbow trout that have been here for some time. Then there's also with the difficulty of spawning. So um, currently over by Derby Dam, there's a lot of silt and not as much good habitat for their ability to lay their eggs when they spawn. Um, and this results in less successful spawning rates, uh, less fecundity in terms of their ability to successfully spawn. Uh, hybridization is a huge problem with our rainbow trout. So um, as those two uh, kind of come together, the Lahontan cut their trout and the rainbow trout, they'll hybridize and those hybrids are going to be able to continue to reproduce. Therefore, it's kind of going to start reducing the genetic diversity of the Lahan cutthroat trout, which is another problem that we have to deal with. And lastly, habitat loss. Um, habitat loss is a pretty big problem for many species in today's age, just with the growth of the human population and everything like that. Uh, we have more demand for things like water, um, resources, recreation, everything like that. So habitat loss has contributed to um, a lot of problems with the Lahan cutthroat trout, whether it be from improper grazing or um, just not enough availability because water levels drop pretty badly when there's drought. And so all of these have consequences. So um, the competition aspect, you know, it's gonna increase that non-native population, making it hard for us to get self-sustaining Lahan cutthroat trout populations. The hybridization is going to result in loss of genetic diversity. Habitat loss is going to result in, you know, separation and possible speciation of the Lahontan cutthroat trout over a long period of time. 
or you could totally lose the species altogether. So that's a really big problem. And then having spawning difficulties uh, makes recovery a lot harder because if we're relying on these numbers to increase every year, but they're not increasing the way we expect them to, that's also going to be a pretty large problem as well. So we have a problem to solve here. And there are a few things that we can kind of look at this. Um, I'm gonna look at the chat real quick though. Awesome, thanks Carrie. Yeah, so uh, it is really amazing to see that they've been able to start spawning again since the 1930s um, past the Derby Dam. So I'm really hoping that this could be a really big uh, page turned in the story of the Lahan cutthroat trout recovery. So since we don't really have a huge audience right now, we'll kind of just go through this. Uh, if you want to participate, you can. So we have our problem to solve, which is competition. And the biggest things that we're looking to solve in this situation is the Lahan cutthroat trout um, being natural predators, but also food for other fish. And despite being those skilled predators, they're often outcompeted by those non-native fish, uh, like we said, those browns and rainbows. And we know that they're known to hybridize with those rainbow trout, and that's going to possibly result in loss of genetic diversity over time. So we can see that those rainbows and browns being there is causing a couple different problems for our Lahat and cutthroat trout. So this is definitely something that is a complex problem to solve. So we have a few solutions that we have mapped out for today. So some of the possible solutions, solution one would be to do nothing and the Lahat and cutthroat, cutthroat trout will uh, improve on its own. Solution two would be to stock more Lahat and cutthroat trout while still keeping some of the non-native stock um, as well. And then solution three would be immediate removal of all of the non-natives and also stopping the stock of non-natives um, that compete with them. And then solution four would be removing uh, non-native fish that live in the streams that the LCT used to spawn. So this would be maybe only looking for a uh, possible interaction with those pure Lahat and Cutthroat trout populations. Because if we have a really good Lahat and Cutthroat trout population and those rainbows come in, that's gonna cause a little bit more problems. So we like those pure populations of Lahat and Cutthroat trout. Or maybe something else that can be shared in the chat. So I'll launch a poll um, and we'll see which solution would you pick of these four or five if you wanted to list your own solution. And if you don't want to pick, that's okay, because we'll go through them all together. Okay, that's a pretty good solution. All right. Okay, so we will kind of go through these all together. So solution one is to do nothing. This would mean um, that we wouldn't be in, I guess interfering in any way possible, um, we would just allow the Lahan cutthroat trout to naturally improve their populations. Uh, so the pros for this would be that it would not require a budget um, or it wouldn't cost any money. So we wouldn't be having to, uh, we could put that money towards something else if we wanted to. The con of this is that it could possibly result in further decline and moving the Lahan cutthroat trout from threatened to endangered, which is something we really don't want. So we need to think if this would really be a good solution to the problem. Solution two would be to stock more Lahat and cutthroat trout. Um, so this is our hatchery raised Lahat and cutthroat trout that would be stocked more in Pyramid, Lake Tahoe and the Truckee River. Uh, so we currently stock rainbows and browns. So this would just be adding to the stock of the LCT and browns and rainbows. So with this solution, the good thing is that we would be able to put a lot more Lahan cutthroat trout into the river, which would give a lot more opportunity for population to grow. However, it would also keep those non-natives stocked to give a little bit of a buffer and a variety for our anglers as well, so that we can still have people fish, but we don't have to have them catching Lahan cutthroat trout all the time, which would satisfy anglers. The cons is that even with the reduced stocking of other non-natives, they can still pretty much outcompete the LCT 
and it might be expensive to raise twice as many LCT. And we usually have um, kind of an analysis that we do based on our surveys to determine how many that we need to stock to have a good population. The other solution, so solution number three is immediate removal. So this would be removing um, everything kind of immediately uh, in the Truckee River and the surrounding streams. And the good thing about this would be that we'd be able to remove as many non-native fish as possible. Um, that could help really restore those um, pure Lahontan cutthroat trout populations, uh, kind of grow back the original native biodiversity of the river uh, because our rainbows and browns also affect other species as well. Um, and also lessen the possibility of hybridizations. And this is with rainbows that are not stocked because um, our rainbows that are stocked by Nevada Department of Wildlife or any other entity are usually sterile. So hybridizations can only occur with non-sterile ones. However, uh, this can be really costly, require a lot of manpower, and also removing those non-native fish too quickly, like we kind of mentioned in the beginning, could leave a large gap in the food web. And also we'd be removing that variety for anglers. So we have to think about do we want to rush to make such a conclusion? So these are um, some of the things we have to think about as well. And the last solution would be only removing from those spawning streams or those pure populations. So like we said, the predation of LCT starts young uh, and those juveniles and fry are going to be particularly vulnerable. We wanna make sure that they're successful after they've hatched. So this is good because it'll only eradicate some of the fish from these streams. Uh, anglers can still go to places like Pyramid Lake to fish for various different fish um, that may be included in that biodiversity um, and still allow for a good variety. However, um, it's only gonna solve the problem for the initial survival, but the LCT will still have to compete with those non-natives downstream. So that's kind of a problem for them as well. Uh, but it would also require additional research. So we'd have to do a lot of surveys and monitoring of them, uh, which can be costly and require a lot of manpower as well. And if anyone had another solution that they wanted to share, you can totally feel free to share it if you want. All right, so Carrie asked, what about sterile rainbows? Um, so yeah, we actually do have that solution in place right now that we do uh, to prevent hybridization. Uh, we stock a lot of sterile rainbows, so it still provides some variety for our anglers without contributing to a uh, succession of more rainbows in the stream, which is something that has helped quite a bit. All right, so with that, would you change your answer? So I'll launch another poll. And if you would like to change your answer um, based on kind of what we talked about, you can if you want to, or you can keep it if you wanna keep the same answer. Okay, so I see we got some changes. Um, so yeah, like a lot of these are pretty similar. Um, they all just require a little bit of a different methodology, but we're still trying to tackle the same problem. The, this is the hardest thing about um, being an ecologist is that when it comes to managing a species that there's no really correct answer. We can all agree that something is a problem, but have a different way to answer it. And it's definitely full of those tough questions. And I think it's really important too that um, when we all come together and we wanna focus on something like the Truckee River, that we all probably have the right uh, ideas in mind and the right motives. It's just kind of a question on how do we balance everything? How do we make everybody happy? How do we you know, maintain things in the best way we possibly can? So it comes with a lot of challenges. And so what does the Nevada Department of Wildlife do? Uh, we actually partner with a lot of different entities. So we mostly don't really manage Lahontan and cutthroat trout, but we work under the guidance of some of our federal agencies um, as well as the tribal agencies. So the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe um, obviously has a lot of jurisdiction over um, Lahontan cutthroat trout as well. Uh, we also work with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, the Bureau of Land Management. And we may do additional research with the University of Nevada, Reno and some other entities as well. 
The other thing that we try to do is we try to create a really good balance to support angler communities uh, because they do go to us for a lot of our services. Uh, they do have to come to us for certain permits and also um, maybe you know information about fishing in our waterways and invasive species. So we do wanna work with them and not turn our back on them as well. Uh, we're also monitoring the ecological health of the Truckee um, and its inhabitants while balancing that relationship with anglers. So we are always trying to take the best approach possible, to balance things as best we can. So um, with that, why is taking action so important? Uh, so I think that this is important because uh, the Lahunt cutthroat trout obviously is one of our state symbols. Uh, we wouldn't want to see it go away. And I think it's a really great success story to see these fish that were pretty much on the brink of extinction coming back and being in such large size. Um, it really just shows that with the right management and with the right people caring, we can really improve these populations. And I think having that really big success story will be uh, a really big motivator for people to really care about um, you know, the Truckee River and the surrounding environment as well, because it's a huge catalyst for people to come together and be like, we can fix things, we can fix these problems. Uh, so that's my personal reason for taking action as well. And if there's any questions, you can feel free to throw them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, or if you would like to direct a question to me personally um, and you will maybe come up with it later, my email is down at the bottom. So feel free to shoot me an email if you want. I love receiving email questions. And if there are no other questions, we will probably end this. Oh, wait, we got one. Oh, it's just Jess, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Well, I hope everyone has a great evening and a great One Truckee River Month. Thank you for coming, bye. <laughs>